hello there, uh, my name is Chris Pig. This is the Black Pig Printmaking Studio in Froome in Somerset in the UK. Today, I'm going to take you through how to hand print, how to make a relief print without a press. Lots of artists, printmakers uh, are away from their studios right now because most people work in collective studios and they're all closed because of lockdown. Um, so if you're at home, um, you can you can print by hand quite easily. Japanese and Chinese do it all the time. I remember once Tatsuo Noda saying, you in the West have all these print machines that, that weigh tons and tons and tons. I carry my print, my, my print machine in my top pocket, which I thought was a lovely poetic moment. So you can get a Obviously, judging by the Japanese and the Chinese, you can get a good, as good a, a, an impression uh, hand burnishing as you can from a press. Takes more time, and if you've got a very, very, very big print, then uh, I would recommend having a great big uh, etching press to do it with. However, if you're at home and you've got, say, for instance, a wood engraving, which is what I'm going to be showing you today, these little fellas will do the job just as well. First of all, I'm going to take you through the papers that we use in this studio for relief prints. Um, I think I'll start with best, better, best. That doesn't sound, that's not right, is it? But anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so first of all, we're starting with the cheapest paper that we use here. This is really good for very large lino cuts. Um, along with Tsunami Seneca, this paper is called Fabriano Biaprina, Bia Prima. It's a Western paper, obviously. Um, it's, a, it's a book paper, it's used, it's used for in book production. But what makes it a lovely paper to use is that it's heat pressed, so it's got a lovely smooth, smooth surface and it's quite thin, so it's easy to burnish. Don't, if you're thinking, if you're thinking of, of relief printing, don't start with a 300 gram paper with some sort of um, cold press texture on it. Just you're wasting your time because the thicker a paper it is, the more work you have to put into it. And if it's got a texture on it, then it's going to be useless either for, for solid blacks or picking up on fine detail, particularly in an area of solid black. So um, don't. Really what you want is a thin paper. A paper that, you, that is easy to manipulate, that has a smooth surface so that it will take all of that fine detail as easily as possible. Fabriano Bia Prima is an everyday paper that I use a lot and uh, thoroughly recommend it. Next, this is the real workhorse of the studio. One that I've been using for years and years and came to my rescue. Uh, a long time ago when I started doing very large lino cuts and because I was burnishing them by hand sometimes it would take two hours um, I was using Japanese papers and they tended to stretch the the, uh, the papers the mild relief fibers stretched which caused ghosting this is a machine made Japanese paper with a laid paper surface on one side and as smooth as it can get, it's making my feet feel funny just touching it now, um, a smooth surface on the other side, you use the smooth side. Um, Tsunami Seneca is like the Jeeves to my Bertie Worcester. It kind of, um, it feels like an intuitive thing, like it's more than just a paper, it's like a kind of a relationship because it kind of, it feels as if it's intuitive almost, it's a, it's a wonderful paper. And this paper for special occasions, this is a Zirkel paper, 170 grams, so it's quite a lot heavier than the other two that I've just shown you. Uh, again, it's got, a, it's got a surface that makes your feet feel funny when you, when you stroke it, because it's so smooth. Um, also, if you compare it to the other two, it's got a slightly warmer hue, yeah, uh, which I prefer. I find Tsunami Seneca, although the best of papers, um, it's a bit of a harsh white. I prefer something a little bit, a little bit gentler. 
Anyway, so we're going to be using Tsunami Seneca today because um, I'm tempting fate here. It, 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 it never goes wrong. <laughs> um, and I'm going to be showing you how to hand burnish. Now, right now, onto the burnishing tools. Ooh, and I've just remembered that I've forgotten one. Turns out I'd forgotten two, two, two tools, um, which are two uh, Victorian engraving tools. Well, I'll tell you about that in a minute. First of all, if you're starting and you're on a budget, the good old humble old wooden spoon is just excellent. It'll do just as well as any of any of these tools. Um, if you can look, I don't know if you can see on there. There's there's a there's a patina on the burnishing area where it's been rubbed smooth by rubbing on paper for lots and lots of times. If you want to fast track onto that patina, what you need to do is buy yourself a wooden spoon. It's better if it's a new one. And then rub down the surface with a very, very fine uh, sandpaper and then rub it against some waste paper until it gets this shine on it. Then it will do just what you want it to do. It'll it, it'll it'll um it'll burnish superbly. Next, this is just for um, anecdote's sake. When I was um, a little shaver, uh, first at art school, an arrogant little chappy, um, this was one of my first ever V, v gouges, and um, when it had packed in because I didn't know how to look after things, um, I used the handle as um, a burnisher and so I don't know if you can see there it's rubbed completely away on the bottom edge. This is an old file gouge from the 1980s, my god. Uh, next, looking at the Japanese tradition, we have this first of all which is a baren, um, which I'm going to show you in use actually. Um, you hold like this and, and you rub on the back of the of, of the print and it's got a, quite a flat interface, right? That's quite a good one. Very quick to work with. Uh, and this, although it's an antler, it's the closest I could get to a wild boar tusk, which is what the Japanese would use for graded tones on um, mokahanga. So you would, so sometimes you see a, a, a fade where, where a colour wears out, where a colour it um, wears, uh, is graded and that was be done with a, with a boar's tooth but in my case I use an antler. Um, On to the Victorian tools. This is a modern one. This is an EC Lyons um, burnisher. It's metal and the problem is with metal, particularly with steel, is it sometimes catches on the paper. You don't get the same lovely patina that you would get with um, either wood or with antlers or anything like that kind of catches on the metal but this is what the this is what the Vic Victorians used that and this one which I use quite often is an actual Victorian um, burnishing tool um, finishing off with my favorite uh, which seems to be ergonomically perfectly made for me this is again an antler um, really good for fine areas for where, where you're needing an acute pressure all right, so I'm going to go straight on without any editing this time, straight into the print. I've got a bed sheet here. This is made with chip paper or newsprint. Um, so I've registered my block. I've inked it up and it's good to go. So I just need to get the piece of paper into position on top. Plonk it down. Now this is the point that's really, really important. Is once it's fallen onto the paper, you need to smooth it down with your fingers. Why is that? I hear you quiz. Well, it's so that the ink adheres to the paper enough that it won't move, that it won't ghost. This of course won't give me a good impression, but it means the paper won't move. Right, so first of all, I'm going to show you how you would work with a butt in. This is one of the things about having um, 
a light paper that's really important is that you can see where you're burnishing. So from the back you can actually see because it's so light. where you've worked and where you haven't. Normally, if I'm hand burnishing, what I'll do is an overall tone with a butt end like this, and then I'll go in with an antler to get the really good solid blacks. If you'd like to just move in a little bit here. There, now, can you see that whoopsie. That under this intense pressure, you can see where you're burnishing, partly because the paper gets darker, obviously, but also if you're in the light, you can see the shine on the paper where it's been burnished. All right. Um, I'm going to take this all the way through and not do a speed up because it shouldn't take that long. When you get to the edge of what you're burnishing, be careful because if you slip over just like I did, you can crease the paper unnecessarily and sometimes in a way that means that the proof is ruined. So you know where the edges are. Get in there, but be careful that you don't flip over. I love doing this. Again, it's one of those wonderful lockdown therapeutic, therapeutic activities. But I'm ever so glad I've got presses for most of this now, because um, if you're doing an addition, God, it can be very, very dull if you burnish the whole lot. I used to do that when I lived in Spain. I still, I was still burnishing prints. Um, but now I use presses generally. The point is with this though, this is the, what I'll leave you with, is that this is every bit as professionally done as something that's done with a press. So if you're hankering there saying, oh, I wish I had a studio like you. You, can, you can do it on your kitchen table and you can get the effect just as well with a wooden spoon as you can with an antler. So, um, so don't let that hold you back. It's good to get the, the, the best uh, materials that you possibly can. Um, so that's, that, that's important, and it's really important that you have a nice, uh, uh, smooth, very, very light paper, otherwise you're just making work for yourself, okay? So we're just going to do the reveal now. Um, I'm hoping to hell it's, uh, it's decent. Yeah, oh no, that's all right. Yeah, that's good. We want solid blacks, and we've got them. Yeah, look at that now. Yes. There you go, smug reveal shop. <laughs> okay, see you soon. Cheers.